there's a burning hell. I believe that Moses led God's children all across the hot sand. And when they came to the river, God parted the waters and they walked across the dry land. I believe in the blessed hope, the book in the blood, and there is no other way. Jesus is the Son of God, and He's coming back someday. The Holy Spirit dwells within us, the Heavenly Father is above. I believe in the blessed hope, I believe in the book and the blood. I believe that Mary was a virgin when she heard Jesus was on his way. I believe if you look inside the holy manger, there's a God laying in the hay. I believe that Jesus died and was buried and he rose upon the third day. I believe that the trumpet's gonna sound so loud, God's children will be caught away. Blessed hope, the book in the blood, and there is no other way. Jesus is the Son of God, and He's coming back someday. The Holy Spirit dwells within us, the Heavenly Father is above. I believe in the blessed hope, I believe in the book and the blood. Blessed hope, the book in the blood, and there is no other way. That my Jesus, Jesus is the Son of God, and He's coming back someday. The Holy Spirit dwells within us, the Heavenly Father is above. I believe in the blessed hope, I believe in the book and the blood. I believe in the book and the blood. Amen. Fantastic. Hallelujah. Man, I was going to stay home and watch TV tonight, but I'm glad I came. Amen. Wasn't that good? Talk about last Sunday, Miss. Meredith sung with her mom, and I told Miss Natalie, I said, she's getting more comfortable and getting them higher notes. And then you got all these youngins coming along singing. I like it. Amen? Amen. I like it. Praise the Lord. That's great. Amen. That means Brother James is going to have somebody when the old folks get too old to sing. Amen? Like Brother Crabtree. Amen? All right. Second Corinthians tonight. If you would, please. Second Corinthians tonight. Boy, I'm tell you what, I'm glad I came to church. Amen. Amen. Choir done great. Special singing good. Amen. Amen. As long as I don't mess the preaching up, we'll be all right. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter number two tonight, if you would. I want to finish up a little appendix here. How do you say that word? Pentage, is that right? You add to something? Whatever. A P.S. But um, I preached about uh, how to restore someone spiritually. And I want to just go back over those. I'm just going to mention them. I'm not going to stay on them. But I have some things that I want to add to it tonight. And I want to get uh, to this, and maybe, Brother Jerry, we might could uh, put this as a second part of that message if somebody wants both of them together. But um, I, I said to you, and we'll read verses 7 and 8. The Bible says in chapter 2, 2 Corinthians, so that counterwise, uh, con- <laughs> here I go again, contrarywise you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. It's kind of what we get the, the phrase, deep in sorrow. Verse number 8, 
Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. And uh, remember I began to preach and to teach and to deal with this chapter and talking about how Paul in 1 Corinthians had dealt with this man. The man had been put out of the church or had at least been dealt with because of the gross sin in his life. But according to what I'm reading, it seems like this man has come back and wanted to make things right with God. And so Paul begins to talk about the ministry of restoration. How do you get somebody back to where they need to be? And I said, and I just give you these and I want to go on to what I want to give you tonight. But I said that if you're going to restore someone spiritually, number one, you need to do a self-examination. Number two, you need to have scripture examination. What does the word of God say about where they are? Number three, the sinner needs to be approached. Go to that person and try to help them. If that person is not willing to get their life right and they're going the wrong direction, separate yourself from the sinner. And then finally, supplication should be made consistently for that person that God could restore them and give God could get them back to where they need to be. The church is hard to not see people go out the back door but ought to be to see them come down to the altar and get things right with God. Friend, the one that's away from God today may be somebody else but you never know one day it could end up being you and you need to make sure that you're where you need to be with the Lord. Now I want to look tonight at a couple other things. I want you to look in verse number 7. There's one word tonight that I'm interested in. And I want you to see the word where the Bible says, so that contrarywise you ought rather to, and look at this word, forgive him. Forgive him. And uh, I preached about biblically how to restore somebody. But now what I want to do is I want to preach a little bit about this idea of forgiveness. You say, preacher, what do you mean by that? Listen, I am convinced that in order to see somebody restored, uh, there must be forgiveness in the life of those that are willing to restore an individual. Let me say it like this tonight. If you tonight know of someone that gets away from God. Someone that strays away from the Lord. Uh, Maybe they disappoint you. Uh, Maybe they let you down. Uh, Maybe you never thought you'd ever see that person walk away from God. And friend I want to say this. All of us have been there. All of us have seen that and sometimes it really breaks our heart. But you know what? We can never restore them until we forgive them in our heart. We have to make that right with God in our own heart. And Paul said, look, it's great that we're going to try to get this person restored, but he said, you have to forgive someone that does something like that. And I want to say this to you. This not only applies to someone like here in 1st Corinthians or 2nd Corinthians or the man that was in 1st Corinthians, but this also applies to our everyday life. I want everyone to listen to me tonight. Uh, now listen, I didn't set the ball game and go to sleep last night, so don't you say why I'm preaching go to sleep, amen? I want everybody to listen to me, and I wasn't talking to y'all girls, but listen to me anyway. I want you to watch this tonight. One of the things that is needed in the church today, one of the things that is needed in marriages, one of the things that is needed in families is this area of forgiveness. Amen. Forgiveness. Free, can I tell you this? You can tell someone uh, a statement like, well, I forgive you, but I won't forget. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness uh, goes a little farther. And I will share with you a little bit of what Paul meant by that. But I want you to understand that many people in our day see forgiveness as a weakness. Many people look at forgiveness as a sign of weakness. When somebody cuts a car in front of you uh, and you, you are, you're angry because they cut in front of you or whatever, uh, it'd be real easy uh, to want to retaliate, but it would be a little different to just say, I forgive them, they ought not do that, but it's not worth ruining my whole day. And you say, why does that matter? It matters because you've got to understand forgiveness and letting things go like that will help you in your own life, and it is not a weakness, it's a biblical attribute. Amen. Amen. 
Learning to forgive is one of the great biblical attributes of the Bible. Learning to forgive. Listen, we're all, we're all one day going to need to forgive someone, but I want to tell you this, we also better realize that we may need some forgiveness our own selves. And we need to understand that God will help us in the area of forgiveness. Listen, I want to say this, it is not a sign of weakness. So in our day and time, uh, no one wants to say, uh, I forgive you, because everybody wants to say, it's always somebody else's fault. Somebody else caused this. Somebody else did that. Somebody else caused me to do this. And we never really want to forgive. Why? Because in our secular humanism society today, uh, forgiveness is looked at as a weakness. But it is not a weakness. Uh, it is a strength in the life of every single person. Amen. Amen. Listen, I've been 33 years in the ministry. I can peel on my head tonight, honestly, and not know of anybody that I need to forgive. You say, preacher, you, you got, I'm being honest. I'm being totally honest. Now, there's some people I'm not going to go out to supper with. There's some people that I don't really see eye to eye with. There are some people that I, I think probably should have come to me through the years and said, Preacher, sorry I said that. Sorry we spread that rumor. Sorry we did this. Whatever. But I'm going to be honest with you. Man, I just build a bridge. I'll be honest. I go to my prayer in the morning, read my Bible, and I say, Lord, I don't have any all. I don't have anything against anybody. I don't have anything in my heart like that. Friend, when you've got families that won't speak to one another, and when you've got people that can't forgive in homes, and they can't forgive in church, and they can't forgive. You are living a miserable life, and you need to let it go and enjoy the journey. Amen. Amen. And I want you to understand tonight, I mean it, I'm saying it before God in you. 33 years, I've been through a lot in the ministry. I've been through a lot, some of you have no idea. But I'm going to tell you the honest truth. When I peel my head tonight, one thing God won't have to deal with me the judgment seat about, I've let it go. You know why? Because no one else is going to stand before God but me. No one else is going to give account of my life but me. We all must stand before the Lord. And so I've just let things go like that in my life. I've learned if I let things go like that, I can be happier. Amen. I can be happier. Speaking of that, speaking of that, uh, Miss Brenda's been a great secretary for us here at Calvary. And I appreciate it. But she said, she, she's fired. And uh, I'm just going to do it publicly. And, uh, and uh, she, uh, she sent home a Elvis doll singing. What's that, Miss Wendy? Merry Christmas, baby, something like that. Anyway, and put, my wife put that thing in our bedroom. And if she don't hit the button on it, she's singing the song to me. And I think probably the latter is worse than the beginning. But anyway, the other day I kept thinking, why is she coming by me and patting me on the head and saying I love you and rubbing my cheek and going by and I mean just kind of mushy. Then I realized it's Hallmark. Amen. It's all him love Christmas. I mean him love. And you know every time they fall in love it'll start snowing you know and, and hallelujah. Amen. Yeah, I thought I'd really made an influence on her. It had nothing to do with me. Amen. Anyway, it has nothing to do with what I'm preaching, to be honest. Besides, I do have to forgive her, Miss Brenda. So, Miss Brenda, I hire, Miss Brenda, listen, you're talking to Miss Kathy now. I hire you back. I hire you back because I have to forgive you. So, I hire you back. Amen. And uh, anyway, understand that forgiveness is not a sign of weakness. But I want you to listen tonight. Our unwillingness to forgive others produces hatred, bitterness, animosity, anger, and eventually retribution. Can I say that again? Our unwillingness to forgive produces hatred, bitterness, animosity, anger, and eventually if you get all that built up, there'll be retribution. You want to get retribution to somebody if you don't learn to forgive. But friend, can I tell you this? Learn to forgive in your life and move on. Amen. I mean, your church could be salvaged. I mean, your home could be saved if people would learn to forgive. Now watch. Let's get back to our text. Before we can help someone, we have to be willing to forgive them. Let's just say 
that Brother Kimmer uh, went out of church and got out of church and he did some things that were totally wrong publicly. And so Brother Kimmer was approached and he would not get those things right. And because of that, as a pastor, I had to take it from being a youth pastor. And, and he had to go through discipline church. And I even had to tell the church, look, I don't want your kids hanging around Brother Kimmer outside of church because he's got some things in his life's not right. Now all of that's biblical, by the way. I just preached it. And so anyway, let's say one afternoon, Brother Kimmer calls the church office and he says, Brother Chris, going to come by and talk to you. I said, sure. He comes by and sits down on the couch in my office. Brother Kimmer says, preacher, I got away from God. I have done some things I ought not do. I have shamed the youth ministry church. I have shamed, I've done things wrong. And he said, preacher, I want to get my life right with God. I say, preacher, what would you do? I'd help him get his life right with God. And then after he got his life right with God, there may be some steps through the church he might have to do. He might have to make a public apology, whatever, if he was in leadership or if it was necessary and it was public, but whatever. But the next thing I would do, I'd bring him for the church. I'd say, church, listen, Brother Kimmer's got these things right with God in his life. Let's forgive him. Now, some of you are going to be mad because you're going to say, well, you know what? He got up there and preached. He said he loved the young people. He said he loved the church. And here he is, got out in the sin. He said, he let me down. He discouraged me. Boy, he, he caused me to even doubt my own walk with God because I had so much confidence in him. Can I tell you something? You've got to get way past that. Because what you've got to get to is you've got to get to the place that you look at Brother Kimmer and you say to Brother Kimmer, I forgive you. You know why? You can't help him if you don't forgive him. You can't help him if you don't forgive him. Amen. For all you listening by the way of internet, this was a hypothetical situation. Brother Kimmer, uh, besides maybe saying a few things when his tooth hurt, is still right with God. Amen. Now, I want you to understand uh, that we, we have to forgive before we can go to the next place. Because here's what the Bible says. And be ye kind one to another, Ephesians 4.32, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Once a person is ready to be restored, there are five things we must do. I want to give them to you. I'm not going to preach them long. I'm going to have you out of here probably before 8.30. I want to give an invitation tonight because I think all of us tonight need to realize these are things and areas of our life that we need to work on and we need to do better. Now watch now. I want to give you this. I don't claim originality for these, but as I was reading them, I think they're worth noting tonight, and I want to give them to you, and I want to share these with you. Once a person, now remember, our first five steps were not when somebody wanted to be restored. Our first five steps were when somebody was away from God, and we were trying to get them back. But what happens when they come back? What do we do? How do we handle that if they want to get their life right with God? Number one, I want you to watch this and stay here in the text because I'm going to come back to a verse. Number one, assure them of your love. Assure them. Assure them. Can I tell you this? The prodigal son broke the father's heart, but he never stopped loving him. Listen, Peter broke the Lord's heart, but he never stopped loving Peter. Understand that you and I have to assure the one that's coming back that we do love them. Assure them of that. Number two, attention. Do not ignore them and remember they are ready to be restored. Amen. Do not ignore them and remember they are ready to be restored. I'm not talking about they're out in the world. I'm talking about they come back and said, hey, I want to get my life right with the Lord. If they do, don't ignore them. Give them the attention they need. I know what somebody would say to be the prodigal son mentality. Well, I've been here the whole time, preacher. Why aren't you making over me like that? I've been here the whole time. Yeah, but listen. That 99 might be here with that one sheep, that one lamb, that one that's got away from the foe. We want to go get them. We want to get them back. Why? Because, understand, the prodigal son, uh, when he even came home, and I know the picture, and some people use the salvation story picture, and you can, but literally he was already the son of the father, and he got away from the father's house. Great picture of somebody getting away from church. 
Well, the eldest son stayed where he should have been. Didn't stay with his heart right, but he stayed where he should have been. But when that young boy come home, daddy made a big deal over it, didn't he? The attention, the attention of the one being restored. Can I tell you that? You better believe. Listen, somebody come walking in that door right now that I know got out and sins, messed their life up, and they come in and they say, Preacher, I want to get my life right with God. But I want to give them that attention. I want to assure them that I love them. Number three, watch this, very elementary. Ask them how are they progressing spiritually. Ask them. Go to them and say to them, and I'll show you this in a moment. Go to and say to them, how are you doing? Ask them. Ask them the question, how are you doing spiritually? How's things going in your life? You see, you need to do that because here, they may come one Sunday, and they may say, boy, I'm ready to be restored. I'm ready to get some things right with the Lord. But when they go home, can you imagine what the devil's going to do? Boy, they're going to leave that day and the devil's going to have everybody. He's going to have everybody that kind of walked by them. They really wasn't even thinking about anything. But the devil's going to convince them Then people don't love them no more. They don't care about them no more. They don't want me no more. I've done this or I've done that. And so sometimes it's just good to go up and ask them, say, look, how you doing spiritually? How's things? Like, what can I help you pray about? I, I'm so glad to see you back. Amen. Right? Number four. Remember I told you to disassociate yourself if they won't get things right? Remember I told you that? That's what the Bible says, mark them. Well now, if they come back in the fellowship, we are to associate with them and we are to invite them to fellowship. Right? Kill the fatted calf. Make ready this great feast. My son was lost and he's found. He's come back. Don't go hide somewhere and pout because everybody's not making over you, said uh, about the prodigal son, uh, of the prodigal son's brother. But hey, hey, we ought to associate with them when they come. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean you still aren't leery. That doesn't mean you don't watch their fruit. That doesn't mean that you're not careful. But listen, let them fellowship with you. Hey, we're having a Sunday school outing. Hey, won't you go to prayer meeting with me? Hey, why don't you go to Bible study? Whatever it might be, just associate with. Them. Amen. I'm talking about when they come back now. We got two, two sermons here, right? I'm not talking about association when they're out in sin and don't want to come back, right? Watch this. The last thing is affirmation. What I mean by that? Well, I want you to look at a great word found in your Bible. Look at verse number eight. Wherefore I beseech ye, which confirm, wherefore I beseech you that ye would confirm your love toward him. Do not miss the word confirm. That's the key word in verse number 8. Here's what Paul said. Paul said, here's the thing. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, he said, this fellow's committing sin. At that time it was fornication. At that time it was almost incest. It was a mess. He didn't want to get right evidently. He must have been popular in the church. Paul encouraged them not to fellowship with somebody like that. So I'm, some got mad at Paul because Paul said put him out. Others were glad that he was put out. But then he comes back and Paul said, look, we can't keep on now if he wants to get his heart right, but he's going to be in deep sorrow. And so he comes back in. Can I tell you this? Even when you scold your children, you still need to confirm some things to them when they come back to you. Amen. Right? I'll be honest with you, and I'll use myself. There were times my daddy needed to, and he did, beat the hound out of me. I ought to say it like that, and I think you know the way I mean it. I don't mean he, well, you know what I mean. I mean, of course, back when I was raised up as a boy, you know, he just swung whatever he caught to what he caught. And our damn time day, I realize you say that, and Lord have mercy, we'll be on Dr. Field trying to figure out why we're some kind of, you know, some kind of uh, whatever. Right? Amen. I'm telling you what, some of this generation day was raised like some of us were raised. Lord, they'd be screaming, child abuse, child abuse. Right? If I'd have raised a lot of child abuse, I'd have got it again. Amen. And then if somebody would try to come take me for my daddy, about eight of them wouldn't have made it. <laughs> Amen. I'm being honest. I mean, I'm just telling you the truth, right? 
a different day. Matter of fact, in our day, uh, you call the police and say, my daddy spanked me, they just kind of laugh at you. Like, well, good. Right? I'm not talking about abuse, but, you know. What does confirm mean in this passage? Paul says, wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. Well, I've already said, associate with him. I've already said, give them a teaching. I've already said, assure the young. I've already said, ask them how they're doing. What does the word confirm mean? Here's what that word means. It means to establish as valid, real, and genuine. Paul says confirm your love to him as genuine, as valid, as the real thing. Right? Here's a case in point. You look at somebody and say, I forgive you, but you know you don't mean it. They know you don't mean it. Because when you said it, there was no affirmation. Amen. And can I tell you this? I told my wife, I'm in the twinks, uh, uh, what's that Paul said? He's in betwinks the two. You know, I, I'm in that in my life when it comes to social media. I like social media in the sense that we can get things out in front of people, that we can send messages out in front of people to, to talk about a meeting or what we got going on in our church. But I'm going to be honest with you, it is so hard for me to go on Facebook and, and to just read what Christian people say. I mean, it's hard. Because it almost, it, it literally almost robs me of joy because here's what my wife and I are talking about and most of the time social media is jabbing at somebody without calling their name but the person you're jabbing at knows you're jabbing them which is about like two kids in a sandbox in kindergarten but here's the thing I asked my wife today, I said, do you think people are really that miserable? I mean, honestly. I mean, what do you do when you, what, what kind of life do you have when you've got to sit down in front of a computer and give everybody a piece of your mind and nobody wants it? And you don't have a lot to give. <laughs> what, what, I don't understand that. Now, y'all help me. Maybe I'm just, and I'll be honest with you. People got, you've got to be miserable. I mean, is that what you dwell on all day? I mean, do you cut your soap opera off just to do that? I just don't. Why be that miserable? Why in the world not have a life that you're happy, enjoying your family, enjoying serving God? Am I, am I, am I, am I right here? Instead of, I'm going to tell y'all what happened today. Honestly, I don't care. I mean, if it's something, you know, you got run over by a truck. Okay. I mean, you, you got people. that jump out of a plane and their parachute doesn't open and they're putting it on Facebook before they hit the ground so everybody will know it. <laughs> Honestly, people got to be miserable. It sure is quiet, isn't it? Some of y'all going, Preacher, do you follow me on Facebook? I follow more than I care. Not that people say bad, but I just think, man, are you not happy? Huh? <laughs> Hear that? You know why? That's the truth. Y'all know it's the truth. Right? How can we love the Lord? if we're not willing to forgive and move on with our lives? And how can I restore somebody that even did me wrong or maybe let me down? 
How can I do that if I can't forgive him? You say, well, preacher, they've let me down two or three times. Well, what did Jesus tell Peter? Peter was spiritual. Lord, should I forgive him seven times? I mean, I'm deep with the Lord here. I'm walking tight. What did Jesus say? Seventy times seven. You think you're spiritual? I forgave him five times. Peter did seven. I'm close. <laughs> Jesus said, all right. How about 70 times seven? Right? Amen. People ask me times, when do you give up on somebody? Well, I mean, if they're reprobate, you know, you can't do anything about it. But praise God, if somebody wants to get their life right with the Lord, I want to be the first one to try to help them do it. Now that doesn't mean I condone what they're doing. That doesn't mean that I'm going. I'm not going to go running chasing them all over Iredale and, and, and every other county around. But if they want to get their heart right with God. I'm all for it. I'm all for it, brother Dermot. We've had our life threatened a couple times. We've had a Christian school. Brother Dermot always back get us killed. But those five, we've seen them come in broken. And you know what we did? forgave right let's stand our feet tonight you guys have been awesome thank you Miss Amy or does she have to take one of the youngins with her she okay you know Miss Amy you got a few of them we tonight right not all of them sick oh, good good I want you to do me a favor tonight this is the second part of this message brother Jerry and if folks want a second part of it Somebody comes to him and says, I know somebody that needs that. And um, sometimes we do. But I wonder tonight if there's any area in your life where maybe you haven't forgiven somebody. You say you have. But have you? You say, boy, I've just, that don't even bother me anymore. Well, you know, I've forgiven some people, but stuff still bothers my flesh. But I'll be honest with you, I'm not going to take jabs. And I'm not going to live my life every day just. (laughs) Life's way too short for that. Amen. Maybe somebody in your heart that you would say, Lord, I need to really in my true deep down heart forgive that person. Or maybe there's somebody tonight that maybe got away from God. Maybe it's disappointed you. And I'm going to tell you, you guys that are preachers, Nothing disappoints a pastor more than to see people just get away from the Lord. Boy, that's disappointing. But I'm going to tell you this. I'm not going to pray at them. I'm not going to pray their car breaks down. I'm not going to pray that they have a flat. I'm not going to pray somebody somebody in their family. All those things could happen. But I'm just going to pray, Lord, help them to get back where they need to be and convict them of where they are. I wonder tonight during this invitation, Brother James, if you could sing a little bit of that for me. And I wonder during this invitation, did God speak to your heart while I was preaching tonight? And boy, just thought, you know what? God spoke to my heart tonight. and I just want to come pray. Would you just slip out of that seat and come pray? If God spoke to your heart, I just feel impressed with the Lord. God told me when I was studying this, but won't you give an invitation about this now? Can I tell you, sometimes it's just good, it's just good to come and say, Lord, Lord, I don't want to deal with that all the time. I don't want to hold on to that. Sometimes you have to take a big old gulp of pride, swallow it and say, Lord, I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on with my life. It's not easy to do. It's not even what we want to do. Our flesh does not want to forgive. And you have to understand this tonight. You have to understand this tonight. If people don't want to get right, you can't do nothing about that. You can only in your heart say, you know what? If they make it right, if they don't make it right, there's nothing you can do. Because that's between them and God. But you don't, well, listen, you don't want somebody else to drink the poison and you die from it. Amen. You want to get that stuff out of your life. You really do. I think that's one reason that I've been around such a happy lady I've been married to for years. I don't know, 
she's ever carried a grudge. I, I mean, honestly, never, as long as I've known her. If she had any right being married to me, she probably had several she could have carried. But I, I don't know if she ever has. Ever has. I, I want you to understand that's helped me in my life because that's where I want to be. And I know for some it's difficult. Some people have been through divorce. I've never had to face that. Some have been through family that won't work together. And love, I'm, you know, I, I, I have, I've had a family that's been pretty close. Some maybe marriage-wise, you know. Maybe it's been some difficult days. And I mean, if you've married long, there will be difficult days. Say amen right there. I mean, we're human. There will be difficult days. But I'm telling you, Paul said it right. He said, confirm your love. Confirm your love. Make sure it's genuine. And please don't miss what I'm preaching tonight. I did not say forgive somebody while they're still living in it. I did not say go fellowship with them while they're still living away from God. You ought to pray for them. You ought to practice the first five things I preached. But if they come with a repentant heart and they're sorry to God and they want to get it right, then it's our responsibility, Brother Crabtree, to forgive them. It's our responsibility to go on. And I hope this helps you because I'll be honest with you. I was sitting in my office studying at home and You know, God knew who'd be here tonight. Just everybody come to the altar may not even be who it's for. God may have somebody else here tonight. You just, you, you, you're sitting there going, you know what? I'm going to go home ponder on that. Preacher's right. I can't live my life with that kind of stuff. Amen. Thank you, Miss Amy. Well, I hope you got some help on this Wednesday night. And I hope the Lord will help us all to to, uh, examine our heart. Um, This is a fun time of the year. But don't make it miserable by making yourself and others miserable. If you're saved and you're happy and you know it, say amen. Amen. Right? I'm, I'm telling you, you're going to blink your eye one day, life's going to be over. And you got to look back at, over your shoulder and say, what I do with it? Amen. I, like, I want my home to be a happy place. I want my church to be a happy place. Right? And it can be if we biblically live our lives. Hallelujah. Wasn't singing good tonight? Amen. Didn't you enjoy the choir? How about them youngins? Wasn't that good? Brother John, we'll have them on Facebook when we on our church page. People can look at it. I like that. We've been putting some of those on there. Father, Lord, I love you. I love my family. I love my church. I love the ministry. Lord, help me to always take a self-examination and keep my heart where it needs to be with you. And Lord, I pray for those. All of us know someone that has walked away from the Lord and gotten away from God. And Lord, it's easy sometimes just to say, well, you know what? They're getting what they deserve. And God, that may be so. Their prodigal son, Lord, he did. He got what he deserved. But the Father never stopped loving him. And Lord, I don't want to have an older brother mentality. When folks get right, I don't want to be jealous of them getting right. Lord, help me to live my life to please you. In Jesus' name. All God's people said amen.